Continuing on with stream landforms, and so next up, a drainage basin or a watershed. So characteristic is every single stream is a part of a bigger drainage basin or a bigger watershed. And we've got very much a hierarchical structure uh, in which smaller streams feed into bigger streams. And so think of it like a tree. Uh, and so we've got the, 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 the stems from a leaf uh, that flow into a, a twig, which flows into maybe a branch, uh, which flows into the trunk. Uh, so the idea is everything flows into, or ev ev everything eventually meets to the bigger, the massive trunk of the tree. Same idea regarding uh, collection of water, uh, i.e. rivers. Uh, and so collected by streams via gravity and slope, of course. Uh, and so every single drainage um, basin is separated by what we call a drainage divide. And so essentially a drainage divide is key to that is interflues or the high ground that separates one drainage basin from another drainage basin or uh, one that separates one stream, one valley from another. So here's a key term, interflues, a term that, well, you know, really, I don't know, we don't use it too often in our own language, but is used quite a bit uh, actually in the field. Uh, so it's essentially, like I said, the high ground that separates one valley from a stream, one valley or stream from another. Image to fall uh, here on the accompanying slide. Here we go. This essentially puts together everything uh, I said in the previous slides. So take a look at this, look at the previous uh, lecture notes, and kind of visualize the terms and the concepts. So like I said, every stream flows into a bigger stream. And so here the ones flow into the twos, the twos flow into the three, and then the threes eventually flow into the one four. Now at the big scale, when we think about actually continental uh, scale, uh, Drainage divides are called continental divides, and so the continental divides are kind of these big picture examples of, of drainage divides or drainage basins slash watersheds. Uh, and so essentially the mountain or highland regions that separate large drainage basins. And so it doesn't always have to be mount mountains, as we'll see here with uh, Indiana and God's country. Uh, and so the idea, though, is continental divides, these massive, they contain many smaller drainage basins that flow into the massive, larger uh, drainage basin. Uh, and so the, in the, big, the biggest in the United States is the Mississippi-Ohio River uh, drainage basin. Uh, and so we'll look at examples of this on some accompanying images. Uh, Indiana, as we've showed on the previous map quiz, pretty much all rivers south of the Tippecanoe River flow to the Ohio River. So the White River West, Flo West Fork, the White River East Fork, the Wabash River, the Ohio River, all flow to the southeast, sorry, southwest towards the Mississippi River, and they're part of the Mississippi River drainage basin. However, to the north, we've got this situation which we actually have rivers in the northern part of the state. Those of you from the region, from South Bend, Gary, even parts you know north of, of Fort Wayne, what happens there is the rivers flow to a totally different direction. Uh, and so where in most of the state, rivers flow from the northeast to the southwest towards the Gulf of Mexico, in the case of those rivers to the north of the Tippecanoe River, they either flow to the Lake Michigan or flow to Lake Erie, which eventually flow to the St. Lawrence Seaway, which eventually flows to the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Ocean. So it's kind of interesting in Indiana, we actually have a continental divide. So here's the Mekong River. So the Mekong River forms the border between uh, many Southeast Asian countries as it begins in China and works its way uh, through Vietnam to uh, the South China Sea. Uh, and so one of the things is this can be very tricky. So the things that they decide to do up in China, i.e. dam the river, maybe for hydrologic power, well, that's going to have a very huge effect on people downstream when all of a sudden that river that they've depended on uh, now becomes a little trickle. Uh, and so that becomes a key issue when we think about rivers uh, when they go through many different countries. And for the most part in the United States, we don't really worry about that. Uh, you know, most of our rivers all stay and go um, within borders. But in other places of the world, this can be very tricky. Uh, and so there's no doubt that water, access to water, water rights will be can become a huge issue going forward in a source of conflict. Trust me. Uh, here we have the uh, world's largest catfish, which was found in the Mekong River Delta at a whopping 9 feet, nine feet uh, 646 pounds. 
Once again, Rio Grande. So here's an example of where we share borders. And I don't care who, which side's which. I don't, I don't even care if this is pollutants or non-pollutants. But whatever is done on one side, of course, is going to affect the other. Finally, our last term we're going to look at regarding stream landforms are barrier islands. And barrier islands are a lot of our vacation destinations. And so characteristics of barrier islands is they're separate from but parallel to a landmass. Uh, it's due to sediment supply from rivers and also low tides, so the combining forces. And so you got one force coming towards the barrier islands, coming down slope, that sediment supply from the rivers being counteracted by ocean influences coming back the other way. And so if you think about waves, well, what direction are the waves coming from? They're coming onshore. That combined with high and low tide creates these thin chain of islands that are parallel but separate from a landmass. And they're always on a trailing edge of a moving plate. And so they're always, so we think about the United States. Well, where in the United States do we have the trailing edge of a moving plate? On the Pacific side, no. Pacific side, we've got a lot of collision uh, with plates, convergence and transform faults. Uh, so essentially, barrier islands, if they existed on the Pacific coast, would be obliterated from uh, convergent forces, from those essentially from uh, two plates uh, crushing into each other. Uh, whereas in the Atlantic side, we don't have that. So the Atlantic side of North America is what we would typically think of the trailing edge of that moving plate. Uh, and so the Atlantic and Gulf coasts, uh, we've got the weathered and eroded away sediment that once was the Appalachian Mountains, which in many respects is the sediment that has created the barrier islands. And so if we can kind of wrap our, wrap our minds around this. So the Appalachian Mountains, we've showcased beforehand, have been you know, they're one of the oldest mountains in the world. And so over time, they've been worn down, weathered away, uh, essentially more hills. I know they're not hills to us, but essentially hills compared to the sharp, angular, rocky features. Well, where did all that sediment go? That sediment just doesn't disappear go off into outer space. And so what happens is that sediment is then weathered and carried away, uh, eroded away, transported and deposited, and then when it's deposited, once again it's deposited at the mouth of that river. Uh, and so we see at the mouth of that river the characteristic barrier islands. But uh, like I say, these are you know are places in which they're massive tourist destinations for all kinds of, uh, of snowbirds, people who go down for a part of the year to vacation. Uh, or live in you know the, the beaches of Carolina, Florida, uh, Texas, wherever. Uh, but they're very poor choices for uh, for real estate development because of these areas being quite susceptible to sea level change. And so as sea level rises, which could happen from a storm surge from a hurricane, as it did uh, with uh, some of the more recent Hurricane Irene, for example. Uh, so, but these are still they're still building these taller buildings. Build them again. Build them again. It's not sustainable, not a good idea. Uh, we'll take a look at that in a future lecture on human impact on the environment. And here we have the, uh, I believe this is the Jersey Shore. Uh, and so we can just see fist pumping and glow tans and all that uh, from this outer space image here. Uh, but one of the things is these barrier islands, which you can see. So barrier, see that island beach, SP, uh, that is part of a barrier island chain running from the northern uh, part of this um, image down to the bottom, uh, close to Mike Kanush, Rutgers University's name. Uh, and so essentially what we've got is these rivers that are flowing from the left-hand side of the image to uh, the intercoastal waterway to these uh, in-between bays and harbors, essentially is bringing sediment that is then counteracted by the ocean currents coming in, uh, which creates this thin chain uh, of islands that we can see here, these barrier islands. And going back to a previous map quiz, we've got over on the far hand, right hand side, the eastern side of this image here, we've got uh, the Outer Banks. And so the Outer Banks are essentially barrier islands created from transported and weathered away sediment from the Appalachians, which is bringing, via the various rivers, uh, bringing that sediment to the Atlantic. Uh, and so it's kind of a deal where the, those, those places that we love to go to, to beach, Outer Banks, Myrtle Beach, uh, Daytona, uh, what those largely are is if you if you drive down there, you go over the interco intercoastal waterway uh, before you get to those beachy areas. And those beachy areas are essentially barrier islands 
uh, which in which that sediment from those rivers upstream, from those rivers that are from you know from many begin up in the Appalachian foothills, brings that sediment to the coast where it's eventually deposited, forming these landforms, barrier islands. And I guess a closer image to see these rivers carrying that sediment to the outer banks. Uh, so down here we've got South Padre, and so South Padre, uh, South Padre you can't really see, it's not shown, but see the uh, inn in Brownsville in the bottom, actually see the inn in Harlingen, uh, the inn in Harlingen is about where South Padre is, and South Padre is part of these chain of islands, these barrier islands, uh, and so essentially the Rio Grande, as it comes from the Rockies, is bringing away weathered and eroded away sediment, and then eventually depositing that weathered and eroded away sediment at its mouth, forming the chain of islands, these barrier islands here in Texas. So Texas, coastal Texas, we can see this barrier island, which goes pretty much all the way along the entire coast, all the way up to Houston, Galveston.